Right. All right, so thank you everybody who is coming here to join us for the next session in our Arts and Sciences and Women and Gender Studies Teach-In. And today we have the pleasure of having Dr. Roger Toller, who's going to be telling us about America's lynching craze and the three women presented it. And I'm going to go ahead and without further ado, I will pass the mic on over. Would you like me to start the slideshow or do you want to say something first? You can start, start with the title slide and we'll go from there, okay? Okay, and everybody can see you talking too with it. Okay. <laughs> you don't need to worry about I, that. So. I'm sorry yeah. about that. Um, I just want right. to quickly say thank you to the College of Arts and Sciences and the Women and Gender Study Program for uh, um, sponsoring this event. And a quick shout out to uh, Dr. Brenda Melendy, who thought of this idea in the first place. Um, and I want you to take notice of this uh, disclaimer here at the bottom of the card. Uh, there will be some graphic depictions of extreme violence and cruelty, and if you're really sensitive to that kind of thing, you may want to look away for about five minutes. All right, we're ready for slide one, Dr. Cook. There we go. The United States of Lynchardom, and why do I have Mark Twain staring at us? Well, he gave us this great title. That's why. It's uh, an essay that he wrote in 1901 uh, condemning lynching in the United States. And uh, we'll get to that at the bottom of the slide. I want to give us a really clear and specific definition of, of lynching. And I can't get more clear and specific than the one from Tuskegee University. Um, which, of course, originally was founded as Tuskegee Institute with Booker T. Washington as their uh, headmaster. Uh, they are the first institution of higher learning to keep track of statistics on lynching. And they defined lynching. And to have a, a real lynching, Number one, you need evidence that someone was killed. A disappearance isn't good enough. You actually have to have the body. And you have to show that that person died illegally. Lynchings are illegal or extrajudicial, if you want to get fancy about it, uh, actions. Um, you can't call a uh, Salem witch trials, lynchings, because that was through judicial process. Maybe a weird judicial process to us, but that was legal. Um, to have a lynching, you need three or more persons participate in the actual killing that we're talking about. And here's the kicker, the group must have acted on a pretext of service. This is service to justice, race, or tradition. According to Tuskegee's numbers, at least 4,733 documented lynchings occurred in the United States between 1882 to 1959. Um, there were lynchings before 1882 that aren't in those figures. Uh, there are events since 1959 that could be pretty easily classified as lynching as well. Overall, in this time period, 72%, a little over 72% of the victims were black. And most historians agree that this is a very conservative estimate, that the real numbers are probably higher. Some historians who specialize in lynching and mob violence estimate that the figures may be double what Tuskegee has written. Based on Tuskegee's numbers, 1891 to 1900, uh, we had an average of 188 lynchings per year with 68% of the victims being African-American. 
So on average, there was a lynching every other day in the United States for 10 years. Of course, some years are actually higher and some years lower than that. Uh, 1892 was the peak year for lynching in the United States. Next decade, 1901 to 1910, first decade of the 20th century, the average drops to 93 lynchings per year. Seems like some kind of progress. Um, we're down to one lynching every four days. But in that decade, the percentage of victims who are black rises to 89%. And this is the time when Twain wrote the United States of Lynchardom, his anti-lynching essay. We associate Mark Twain a lot with a kind of friendly, warm uh, fiction and uh, leave out the idea that he was a very harsh social critic. And so he writes about lynching, calls our country the United States of Lynchardom, and keys in on a lynching that occurred in his home state of Missouri. And I'm pronouncing it that way for Tom Spencer. I hope he's viewing this. Um, Twain goes into details, he includes excerpts from the newspaper describing very graphically uh, what happened to three men who were accused of raping and murdering a white woman. And he never published it. Uh, finally, this is published posthumously in 1923. Uh, at the end of the essay, I got ahead of myself, I do that sometimes. Um, at the end of the essay, Twain's solution to the problems in the United States of lynchardom is to get all the Christian missionaries who have gone to Asia, to the Philippines, and to China to convert non-Christians. Uh, he says they need to all come back and convert the Christians in the United States who are doing this thing. Uh, United States of Lynchardom is finally published posthumously. Twain died in 1910. This was published in 1923. So 22 years after it was written, uh, it remained timely because lynchings continued around the United States. So maybe we earned that, uh, that dubious title. Uh, Dr. Cook, if you please. Error as social control. And we see a publication over here from the Equal Justice Initiative, Lynching in America, confronting the legacy of lynching as uh, confronting the legacy of lynch of uh, racial terror. Lynching was used to keep African Americans, quote unquote, in their place. That is second class citizens between the Civil War and the Civil Rights eras, uh, roughly 1865 to 1965. Lynching uh, begins to rise during the uh, Reconstruction era and continues into the Civil Rights era. The numbers you saw from, the, uh, from Tuskegee are not a huge proportion of the African-American population, let alone the population of the United States. But the threat of being lynched hung over every other, every African-American. The fact that this horrific fate could happen to you provided a form of social control. Don't get out of line or this could be you. And I don't use the word horrific uh, lightly here. Many lynchings involve torture. A lot of them involve burning of the victim, castration, hot irons, uh, red hot irons inserted into various body cavities, and even worse things than that. By the 1890s, we saw the rise of the spectacle lynching when lynchings are 
planned and announced beforehand. And hundreds, in some cases, thousands of people turn out to watch the suffering and eventual death of a victim. Uh, some of these events were even documented by photographers to commemorate the event. And here is a five minute video that we're gonna try to put up. Once again, be careful if you're sensitive. Um, this is without sanctuary. Right, so it's, it's not gonna let me. Okay. So if you look down, you see the, the little uh, purple tab at the bottom right corner of your screen? Says you. you see that? Sorry? You, yeah. You just see me? Um, I well, we're going for the Barbara chat Cook. is. Okay. Oh, chat. Yeah, okay. Ready? Chat is, and then there'll be a little square with an arrow. the bottom where like, there's a chat bubble and then number of attendees and there'll be a little square that will has an arrow pointing out of it you see that oh no i have the chat bubble and when i click on it nothing's happening well not, not don't go to the chat bubble but next to it you should have some other options okay so, all right the number the number of attendees and, and then the next shared content See, yeah, even so professors can learn to do this stuff. Share exactly, content. right? So yeah. Click on that, and then you can share your application or screen. That's probably the easiest thing to do. Okay. And then if you click on that, it'll let you share your entire screen or one of the application windows you have open or a Chrome tab. So if you're sharing it from your PowerPoint, probably one of either you're going to want to do your entire screen or the application window. Let me see sharing too so that it doesn't get in the way of you. Okay. Your screen. Share audio. Now I just hit share. Experiencing technical difficulties. There. Go. Yeah, I do. Okay. So I've got my assistant in here. So right. just get my power. Okay. So you want to share the screen? Okay. We have found, there we go. And then we want to go to the slideshow. Up here? Right there. Okay. Sorry for everyone who just saw my entire hand. Okay, there you go. And then uh, from current slide. From current slide and... There you go. Here we go. men rode into Oklahoma at night and entered the southern south pole by wagon six miles west of town and was flung from the New York Times reported that the victims were tortured with knives before being this charred corpse has come for public display in front of a blacksmith. Dead nigger. That brutal. You did the work of men today. Your deed will resound in every state, village, and hamlet. I'm a picker. It is my living and my avocation. I search out items that some people don't want or need, and then sell them to others who do. In America, everything is for sale, even a national shame. Until I came upon a postcard of a lynching, postcards seemed trivial to me, the way secondhand misshapen Rubbermaid products might seem now. Ironically, the pursuit of these images it brought to me a great sense of purpose and personal satisfaction. Studying these photographs has engendered in me a caution of whites, of the majority, of the young, of religion, of 
of the accepted. Perhaps a certain circumspection concerning these things was already in me, but surely not as actively as after the first sight of a brittle postcard of Leo Frank dead in an oak tree. It wasn't the corpse that bewildered me as much as the canine thin faces of the pack lingering in the woods, circling after the kill. Hundreds of flea markets later, a trader pulled me aside and in conspiratorial tones offered to sell me a real photo postcard. It was Laura Nelson hanging from a bridge, caught so pitiful and tattered and beyond retrieving like a paper kite snagged on a utility wire. That image of Laura layered a pall of grief over all my fears. I believe the photographer was more than a perceptive spectator at lynchings. Too often, they compulsively composed silvery pebble, nature mort, positioning and lighting corpses as if they were game birds shot on the wing. Indeed, the photographic art played as significant a role in the ritual as torture or souvenir grabbing creating a sort of two-dimensional biblical swine, a receptacle for a collective sinful self. Lust propelled the commercial reproduction and distribution of the images, facilitating the endless replay of anguish. Even dead, the victims were without sanctuary. These photographs, evoke a strong sense of denial in me and a desire to freeze my emotions. In time, I realize that my fear of the other is fear of myself. In these portraits, torn from other family albums, become the portraits of my own family and of myself. And the faces of the living and the faces of the dead recur in me in my daily life. I've seen John Richards alone on a remote county road, rocking along in hobby horse strides, head low, eyes to the ground, spotting coins or rocks or roots. And I've encountered Laura Nelson in a small, sturdy woman who answered my knock on a back porch door. In her deep set eyes, I watched a silent crowd parade across a shiny steel bridge, looking down. And on Christmas Lane, just blocks from our home, I've observed another Leo, a small framed boy with his shirt tail out and skull cap off center, as he made his way to Sabbath prayers. With each encounter, I can't help thinking of these photos and the march of time and of the cold steel trigger in the human heart. Okay, before I start preaching at you, okay. Uh, I gotta get out of here. Yeah. And then. That's me sharing now, just in case you. Okay. Let's see if I can get back to you. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Okay, that's you now. Is that us? Yep. All right. Thanks for your help there. Um, 
the reason that I like to show that I like is probably the wrong word, but the reason that I show this video and force myself to do research about this topic is that I really believe that most white Americans don't know the extent or the depth of depravity uh, in this part of our history. And I think that probably a lot of Americans would prefer not to know uh, for all kinds of different reasons. And I believe that many Americans don't recognize the depth of the racial fear and hatred that fueled these kind of kinds of incidents for over 100 years, well into the memories of people still alive in 2020. And more to my point is that I don't think we can, as a nation, really resolve the ra racial issues that we continue to confront until we acknowledge this aspect of our past, until white America does know and does under the, understand the impact of this time in American history on people of color. So that's why I just did that to you. And we're ready for the next slide, Dr. Cook, thank you. I want you to understand that despite the ongoing threat of violence, not just lynching, but other forms as well, African-Americans resisted their second class status. They didn't just sit by passively and take it. And they resisted lynching in particular. Often African-Americans work is segregated like the society that they lived on, lived in, but uh, occasionally, as we'll see, uh, we find white people also working against lynching. And so our focus for the rest of this lecture is the leadership roles that women took in the crusade to end this kind of terrorism. And we're going to look briefly at three leaders in this crusade, Ida Wells Barnett, Jesse Daniel Ames, and Mamie Till Mobley. And we're ready, there we go. This is my favorite picture ever of Ida Wells. Um, if you look up the word resolute in the dictionary, you're gonna find this picture next to the definition. Um, she was a tough woman who would not back down and tremendously courageous in the things she did. Um, she's born into slavery in 1862 in Northern Mississippi, uh, lost much of her family during a yellow fever epidemic when she was 16 and had to raise her siblings. Uh, nevertheless, she educated herself became a teacher and went on to become a journalist in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, 1884, she wins a lawsuit against the Chesapeake, Ohio and Southwestern Railroad over their Jim Crow seating policies. Now this is 12 years before that infamous Plessy versus Ferdinand in case, but the CO and S Railroad would not seat African Americans in their first class cars. Ms. Wells purchased a first class ticket and seated herself in the first class ladies car. And when she was told to get out, she refused to, uh, to leave and had to be physically removed and literally thrown off the train. Uh, she sued the railroad for that and she won in the lower court, but unfortunately the railroad uh, appealed to the Texas 
or I'm sorry, the Tennessee Supreme Court, and uh, she lost there. By 1889, she be had become the co-owner of a newspaper called Free Speech. Uh, she was elected secretary of the National Press Association. So at a little under 30 years old, she's already a community organizer and leader in Memphis with national connections. And then on March 9th, 1892, comes the advice, the event that's going to change uh, the trajectory of her life. Three African American businessmen were lynched in Memphis. As it says here, one was a close friend of Wells. Uh, these three businessmen had opened a grocery store called People's Grocery in part of uh, Memphis called The Bend, the African American district. And right across the street from People's Grocery was a white owned grocery store. And People's Grocery was drawing business away from the white white owned grocery store one night a group of white men uh entered people's grocery after hours and began just trashing the store the owners of the store were alerted and uh, they came down to defend their property a shootout breaks out and they wounded uh, two or three of the intruders. They were immediately arrested and thrown in jail, charged with assault with intent to kill. And of course, there's no trial. Uh, a white mob takes the three men from the jail, very little resistance from the jail authorities, took them uh, a little north of Memphis on a railroad train and uh, lynched them from telegraph poles. And as one, uh, one of Wells's biographers described it, shot them to pieces, just emptied their guns over and over into the bodies. Wells is out of town when this happens. She comes back and finds out that one of her closest friends in the community has been killed. And while she's traveling to another convention, responds with this scathing editorial, condemning lynching, condemning the motives behind lynching, and threatening to reveal the real reasons, what she says are the real reasons, behind the old threadbare lie that Negro men assault white women. And uh, when we use the word assault in the 1890s, you can substitute in the 21st century the word rape. Next slide, please. So she publishes three pamphlets. The first one is Southern Horrors, Lynch Law in All Its Phases. And she reveals, as she had threatened to, uh, the more common motives for lynching, including, in the case of her friends in Memphis, uh, to eliminate business competition. And this is the one that really got her in trouble. False accusations of rape by white women who got caught in consensual sexual relationships with black men. White women were having sex with black men willingly, and then if they got caught, they, they cried rape. And to make matters worse, she actually offered documentary evidence to prove some of these allegations through her investigative journalism. Uh, she also noted that white men raped black women in far greater numbers than African-American women or African-American men raped white women. Uh, while she's still out of town, the newspaper offices looted, her presses were destroyed, and her life was threatened if she ever returned to Memphis. And in fact, she didn't 
uh, 30 years and come home. Uh, instead, she moved to Chicago. She publishes these other two anti lynching publications, The Red Record in 1895 and Mob Rule in New Orleans in 1900. And she will continue to write and speak against lynching, among other causes, uh, into the 20th century. She is not the first African American to publicly oppose lynching, to launch an anti-lynching campaign, but she is the first African American woman to put herself out there this visibly and this publicly in opposition to lynching. And she's a, she's a real hero uh, in that respect. Let's go to the next slide. There we go. There, there's James. She's a native Texan uh, who, like Mrs. Barnett, uh, was involved in a lot of different causes. You see a lot of growth in women's participation in social causes in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, do gooder kinds of uh, work. And uh, both, for example, both Ida Wells and uh, Jesse Ames were involved in the suffrage movement, as well as their anti lynching campaigns. In 1924, Ames became the director of the Texas Council on Racial Cooperation. This was a region wide organization that had been formed in 1917 originally. It's an organization formed by liberal white Southerners to improve race relations. And that, of course, included abolishing lynching. Uh, it's a paternalistic group, no question of that. Uh, they reached out to moderate, educated African-American leaders to guide the uneducated mass of blacks in constructive race relations. I'd like to see someone say that sentence today uh, to African Americans in, in the United States. But nevertheless, this council was in response to economic and demographic change and racial violence that resulted from those changes brought about by World War I. Uh, it's clearly uh, paternalistic, it's racist from our pers perspective, but they were trying to improve relations between the races, trying to avoid more trouble, taking little tiny steps forward. In 1930, Mrs. Ames founded her own organization based in Atlanta, the Association of Southern Women for the Prevention of Lynching. And she was partially funded there by the Council on Interracial Cooperation. And the first thing we notice from the 21st century is that, oh my goodness, association excluded women. This is a white only segregated anti-lynching organization. Instead of having African women, African American women talk, they're, they're out there demonstrating with the NAACP by this time and others. Um, she had the white woman women whom lynching was supposed to protect speak out against it. Remember that you have this racist idea that African American men cannot control their sexual urges. They love to rape white women. 
this is what people believed in this time. And obviously, unfortunately, but We know this is not the case, and by 1930, we have white women who are willing to say this is not the case and you can't do this in our name anymore. Let's see the pledge. There we go. Here's the pledge against lynching. I'm not going to try to read this whole thing to you. It's, it's a good long pledge. Uh, but they declared lynching an indefensible crime, destructive of all principles of government, hateful and hostile to every ideal of religion and humanity, debasing and degrading to every person involved. Public opinion has accepted too easily the claims that we're doing this to protect white womanhood in the South from the bestial uh, urges of African-American men. And she says, we can't do that anymore. We can't accept the acts of lynchers. And, and they solemnly pledge their, themselves to creating new public opinion in the South, which won't condone for any reason acts of mobs and lynchers, and hopefully you see in this line the attempt to eradicate lynchings and mobs forever from our land. And this was 1930, first years of the Great Depression. This is at least in part in response to an uptick in lynchings due to the financial dislocations of the Depression. Next slide. The effects of the association, um, well, for one thing, Ames and the membership still in 1930 encounter extreme hostility and threats of violence, death threats for circulating these petitions. Uh, nevertheless, 40,000 women signed the petition. And by 1940, there were more than a hundred women's organizations of all races that had joined the anti-lynching movement, had tacked anti-lynching onto their specific agendas. So Ames and the Association of Southern Women for the Prevention of Lynching brought white women into the struggle. And that was going on parallel to the NAACP's effort to organize African-American women against lynching. And when the uh, Great Depression ends, late 30s, uh, lynchings decline for about the next 15 years. Every year you see the number of lynchings going down. Same thing that had been happening in the 1920s before the Great Depression. But in 1955, we're gonna see another uh, infamous lynching case. Uh, next slide, please. And that's when maybe Till Mobley becomes an activist. Um, Ms. Mobley was born in Mississippi, but her family migrated to Chicago shortly after her birth. That's one of those um, um, demographic shifts going on uh, around the time of World War I and beyond. Uh, once African Americans in the South had the ability to get out of the South, they voted with their feet, as it said, and they out migrated to industrial jobs in the North that paid better and that they expected would not uh, provide such a hostile racial environment. So, Amy 
moves to the Chicago area. She marries Lewis Till in 1940. And their only son, Emmett, was born in 1941. And I'm hoping if you've had 1302 or you've had studied that period in American history at all, you know where this is headed and you know the name Emmett Till. In August of 1955, Emmett goes back to Mississippi to visit relatives. He's 14 years old and he's lynched for allegedly wolf whistling at a white woman, uh, a woman who worked in a local grocery store in a small town. Uh, her husband, another man, and several of their friends take Emmett from his relative's home. They beat him. They drive around this community, taking turns beating him. Then finally, early the next morning, they shoot him in the head. Uh, they tie his body to a fan from a cotton mill and dump it into the Tallahatchie River. His remains are recovered two days later. Amy Till becomes an anti-lynching and pro-civil rights activist at that moment when her son dies. She publicized her only child's death. She has an open casket funeral and allowed publication of photos of Emmett's body in the Chicago Fender, Defender, a longstanding African-American newspaper, and Jet magazine. Uh, you see Mamie here at the funeral with a, uh, you see the glass top on the coffin. I am not going to show pictures of what Emmett looked like in the coffin. The photographs you see up here on the coffin lid, those are there so that the bot, you could remember what he did look like because his corpse was basically unrecognizable. You can find these pictures online if you want to see uh, something like that. But uh, even though I'm a, a little desensitized to lynching pictures, uh, I draw the line here and we're not going to look at what was left of a 14 year old kid after what happened to him. Uh, instead, let's uh, see the next slide on, uh, on Mamie. She devotes the rest of her life to activism. First at the request of the NAACP, and then later she continues on her own. She toured the country speaking about Emmett's death, the crying lynching and racism up until 2000, up until just a few, three years before her death. Many of her efforts were concentrated on education. She constructed her uh, public appearances around the idea of educating the public about these issues. Um, after Emmett's death, she went back to college and uh, graduated in 1960 and taught for 23 years in the Chicago public school system. She deserved a medal just for 23 years of duty in that school system. Uh, she also formed an extracurricular group called the Emmett Till Players, who would recite speeches by famous civil rights figures like Dr. King, Frederick Douglass, and uh, that organization, the Emmett Till Players, are still operating in Chicago today. Uh, she set up a foundation to help struggling African-American students, named for Emmett. And she sat for interviews frequently for documentary films and TV broadcasts. She used her role as a mother, as a grieving mother, to relate to people and to gain support for racial justice. If you see some of these uh, videos of, of uh, Mamie Till, 
she's just this warm character. You just, you want to hug her and you want her to hug you. Just before her death, she completed her memoir, The Death of Innocence, the story of the hate crime that changed America. Um, you can make an argument for that subtitle. Uh, Emmett Till is murdered in August of 1955. And if you remember your civil rights history, uh, Mrs. Parks famously refused to give up her seat on the bus in Montgomery, Alabama in December of 1955. So four months ahead of that event, Mamie Till is publicizing her son's murder and several Several civil rights historians argue that that was the beginning of the public civil rights movement that most of us associate uh, in the 1950s and 60s. Inscription on her great stone says it all, her pain united a nation. And we have one more slide here to look at. Thoughts for consideration, some things I'd like you to think about if you want to type responses into the chat or just uh, just go away and think about this. Um, look at this image, this illustration, the noose, the Black Lives Matter um, logo, and behind it, all these newspaper clippings regarding lynching from an earlier time in the 20th century. Um, what's the connection implied here? And is that connection valid? You gotta decide that for your own. I'm, you know, I just, I just throw them out there. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't try to decide for you. Something else uh, to consider here is the question of why women are so involved in this anti-lynching crusade. Both black and white women, women of all races, are involved in large numbers in trying to end uh, that kind of terrorism. Why is that? And then any thoughts or reflections you may have had after viewing these images, listening to me talk, or reflections, if you wanna edit them in the, uh, in the uh, chat, by all means do. And we already saw one from Dr. Melendy, who admires the white women who were willing to stand up in the 1930s and uh, say, yeah, you can't do this in our name anymore. Anybody else have anything to say? Don't be shy. You know, you, you'll have a name there, but you're relatively anonymous. Ah, Shannon Baker. I think the. Yep, okay, gotta get back there. Oh, wow, well, we're getting. So many men are involved because women get involved because of their sons and husbands, their family, male family members. Shannon Baker. Uh, perhaps women stood up as activists trying to the notion of you know, universal motherhood ah, as we see in Latin America. You can take the Latin American historian out of the department, but you can't take the, the uh, department out of the Latin American historian. No, it's a good, it's, it's a good uh, idea, a collective uh, kind of consciousness uh, we see aspects of that idea of universal motherhood, not surprisingly, throughout the world. 
Anybody else? Oh, yeah, okay. Cynthia Cabrera, thank you for your contribution. Uh, that women wanted these men to have a chance at a future. Yeah, absolutely. Extreme an extreme case like Emmett Till, 15 years old, he doesn't have a future. Priscilla Garcia, I do believe that it is a valid connection in this illustration as the lives of African Americans were disregarded by many during this period of time. All right, a good comment. And she's just kind of, ooh, Delissa Garcia. Women are acting because of the natural mother's instinct. Thank you. Anybody else? Got anything? All right. Well, I guess then it's time to wrap it up. Thank you all for uh, for uh, turning out to view the uh, the slideshow and to listen to my presentation. And uh, thanks for your comment. Brenda, uh, Dr. Melody asked, what about male activists and their natural fatherly instincts? I think it's a wonderful question. It also made me wonder if, uh, because it was so, this is my question, this is, I'm, I'm tacking on a, an additional question to Brenda. Was, was the extra vulnerability to lynching something experienced more by males, maybe making it harder to speak out? I don't know. I don't, I, I'm not as familiar with the, the activists at this time. So I, I'm wondering if maybe it, that's part of it as well. I think, I mean, you saw a few lynched women in the slideshow. I think that threat of that kind of violence hangs over more, hangs over all African Americans, but I keep using that metaphor, hangs over, and I should find a better one. Um, but certainly men were more susceptible. We find a lot more men being lynched. Uh, I can say that much. Natural fatherly instinct. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, that's one reason. Having family members uh, lynched, another good reason, the fact that you could be lynched. another reason there's all kinds of reasons for people to get active an issue you're you're absolutely right about uh, lynchings not uh, being reported um, there are well, some have been reported after the fact also, but I remember a case in Georgia a few years ago where a young black man was lynched by the local clan uh, in his backyard. So these things do still go on sometimes. Uh, we had a situation during the BLM, BLM protests this summer where in California, two different African-American men, relatively young, you know, in their 20s, I believe, uh, were found hanging in trees. 
And uh, as far as I know, they were both ruled suicide. Yeah, standard protocol. What is standard protocol? And I guess my question would be, what is standard protocol for law enforcement for African Americans? And is that different for white folks? If I didn't want to be taken out of my car and somehow resisted, would I be handcuffed, pushed down on the ground and have a police officer kneel on my neck for nine minutes until I died? I, I kind of doubt it, you know? Cynthia, I don't want to neglect you. Uh, Black Lives Matter wants this to show the past, the present, hopefully the future to change. Yeah, what's that uh, quote from William Faulkner? The past isn't dead, it's not even past anymore. Yeah, that's a good observation. And then we get into the whole, Anisha, we're back to you. Uh, we get into the whole discussion of what makes you perceived as a threat. And in many cases, it appears that the, the very color of your skin makes you threatening to some people of different skin color. Oh, wow. I lived in Memphis. I've driven through a couple times, that's all. So you lived in uh, Ida Wells country. Did you hear or see much about her when you were living there, Cynthia? I think we're experiencing, ah, there we go. Aha, uh -huh. singer you met and schools of Booker T. Washington, yeah. Yeah, he was the more acceptable African-American reformer for white people, uh, more of an accommodationist, uh, not too, not too radical and therefore not so scary. So do we have anything else? We've been in here for an hour. Uh, I really appreciate the, the interest and uh, the participation after. And uh, thank you. This has been a really good experience for me. And thank you very much. And this was an incredible, incredible presentation, incredible talk, incredible discussion, and and so vital. Uh, I see. Uh, I see. Dr. Melody has her hand raised. I, I'm not sure. Let me see. Hold on a second. I think I can actually give you. 
There, I can give you power to talk, Dr. Melendy. If you like. Or not. Um, while we wait to see if, if she wanted to say anything, wanted to add anything, I, I think uh, this is, in particularly, I, I do see a couple of my own criminal justice students in this class, and I think it's so important to, oh, the clap emoji, yes, okay. Um, <laughs> yes, round of applause. I think it, it is so, it, one of the things that it's a lot of times in discussing um, issues of lynching and issues of police brutality, of our less comfortable parts of history, it, it, uh, it, it can be difficult to talk about and teach. And I think you've done a phenomenal, phenomenal job of, of, of making us think and really setting the stage for this discussion and a lot of good food for thought. And um, I think I, I, I just wish that every classroom could have this exact discussion and conversation because I think that um, similarly to actually Dr. Melendy's presentation, we often forget these important parts of history. And then when we're in a time of social political crisis, like we are right now, we've forgotten that no, lynchings haven't gone away. Exactly. White, whites were like the vigilantes. Yes, exactly. Like we talked about in the history of policing and people taking matters into their own hands. And we think of them as, as vigilantes as being part of something in our distant past, as lynchings being something in our distant past, as the KKK being something in our distant past, ignoring the fact that it's here and present. And we need to address. Vigilantes were just a stopgap until real legal authority arrived on the frontier and we can put that away now and, yeah uh, no, we can't. And <laughs> so um thank you again very much um for your presentation i did want to share because tomorrow we have our next teach-in talk and i actually make sure i pulled up a little presentation here our little little uh, advertisement here we have another history professor Oh, why is it? Oh, it's not showing the whole thing for some reason. What in the world? Oh, there we go. Okay. So we have no reparations, no justice. Why justice demands reparations for slavery by a lecture by Dr. Dean Ferguson. And I feel like it's a good next step in this conversation we're having actually as well. Just let her know that that's happening tomorrow. And we we'll hope to see you all there as well. Do you have any parting thoughts, Doctor? Um, just, I'm humbled and grateful for all your kind words. And again, by the level of turnout we had and participation, and I'm grateful to have people hear this message. And you know, if we're gonna preserve these. Um, if we're gonna have them recorded, they're available. Get yep, them into they are recorded, and we will be yep. making them available. Yes. So feel free. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. And hope to see you tomorrow.